Well, with all the activities today, we're only going to go through 14 verses. It's one chapter. Just one chapter. In fact, it uh, starts a series of uh, four visions, and we're only going to get through two today. Just two of the visions that happens in uh, chapter 7 and chapter 8. We're only going through Zechariah chapter 7 today. So we pick up. Let's just uh, pick up and see what the text says, and it gives us a timeline. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1 says, In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Cheslev. That tells us something, folks. That means that this is happening on the night of December the 7th of 518 B.C. That means that between this vision of chapter 7 and the last two visions that have happened, or last three visions that have happened, two years has passed. The temple has begun. It, has been being, it is being built. It is not completed. It's probably about 75% completed. But as they go higher, it gets harder whenever you're not using cranes and things like that. They've got to rebuild this temple. They've got to get the, the, the timbers up there. They've got to get the roof on. So we are two years down from the last vision that the Lord proclaimed to Zechariah. So that's where we are. It is, it is December the 7th, 518 B.C. Verse 2 says, Now the town of Bethel, and Bethel's a pretty important town in Israel, especially in the earlier years, especially in the years with Abraham, because Abra when Abraham came into what will be known as the promised land after his father died, and he finally enters into the land, it's Genesis chapter 11, Abraham comes down between this little area that's going to be eventually be called Bethel and this little area called, this mountain place called Ai, and there's where he builds his first altar to the Lord between Bethel and Ai in what's going to be called the Promised Land. It's, he's just come down. His father has died. He finally is released to come down into this land, and every place he sets his foot is going to become part of the Promised Land. So these men have come from Bethel. They had sent um, Sharazer, Regimelech, and their men to seek the favor of the Lord. So we have two men that we know their names, and other men have come with them. Now, folks, look at those names. Those names are not Hebrew names. Those names are Assyrian names. What does that mean? Well, if you remember, when the Assyrians took over the northern kingdom, and they moved a whole bunch of the people out of the northern kingdom over to Assyria. They sent people into uh, Assyrians into the northern kingdom to assimilate, to marry into the Jewish bloodline. That happened. All right, speed on down to the days of Jesus. Jesus goes to a woman in Samaria at a well. She is the woman at the well. She is the Samaritan woman, but by this time, Samaritans were not allowed to go to Jerusalem to worship because their blood was not pure. Their blood <coughs> had been mixed with that of the Assyrians. And so she could only worship there at the mountain where Jacob, so they lived on the land that Jacob had lived on. They could only worship there at the place where Jacob had built, built a temple, but it had been torn down in the battles a long time before. She was serving water from the well that Jacob had dug, a forefather, a wonderful forefather, Jacob, but she couldn't go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. And she says to the Lord Jesus, she says, I've heard of the temple. I've never been able to visit there. Uh, are you trying to tell me I'm going to have an opportunity to worship at the temple? That's the story that goes along. That is because she was half-breed. She was half-blooded, maybe in less than that, because of the Assyrians moving in. We have two names here. They are Assyrian names, which means they are men who have been there who are left over and they were not taken into exile, but were probably children of men who came over, married women left in the land, and they gave them Assyrian names. Now listen. When you get a bunch of men together, ah, let's talk about boys. When you get a bunch of boys together, whether they're good boys or bad boys, some cream's going to rise to the top in that group of boys. Let's say it's a bunch of bad boys. Somebody's going to rise to the top as the leader of the bad boys. Or if you got good boys, some one of them is going to rise to the top as being the leader of the good boys. 
Well, here we've got two men who are half-breeds, and they've got men around them that follow them, and they are the cream of the crop of that group of folks, and they're coming in to ask a question to the priest. So let's go on and see what they say. Verse 3, speaking to the priest who belonged to the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, saying, and they're going to ask a question, Shall I weep in the fifth month and abstain as I have done these many years? What in the world are they talking about? Let me tell you what they're talking about. Back in 586 B.C., on Sunday morning, August the 4th of 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar was so mad at Zedekiah. He was furious with Zedekiah. He had set Zedekiah up as king. He had every right to be king because he was in the kingly line of the southern kingdom. He sets Zedekiah up as king, and for several years, Zedekiah bucks Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has finally had it. I mean, he has had it. He comes and marches into Jerusalem, and he destroys the temple. He knocks every single stone off of the walls, and he sets the, the, all the wood that is holding everything together that comes from the cedars of Lebanon. He set them afire, and literally the temple was burned to the ground on the tenth day of the fifth month. That's the fifth month of the Jewish Hebrew calendar. On the tenth day, he totally destroys the temple, knocks it to the ground, burns it. Lo and behold, the Israelites, when they get carried off into exile, decide we need to set up a memorial day for the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem on, on August the 4th of 586. So every year, on the 10th day of the 5th month, they had a day of mourning and fasting because of the loss of the temple. So these men have now come to the priest. Now, the priests are responsible for answering questions according to the Mosaic law. This is not a Mosaic law question. But this fasting on the 10th month, on the 10th of the 5th month, has become so important to them that they come and ask the priest, now that this temple is going back up, by the way, it's two years from being commemorated. It's two years from being commissioned. It's two years from everything starting in the temple. But even though they're about three quarters of the way up, there's a lot of work to do. And the higher you go up, the harder it is to do it. <clears throat> it's not, it's going to be two years. They said, now the temple's going up, should we continue to fast on the 10th day of the fifth month? Should we continue to do that? Look what the Lord answers. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, came to Zechariah, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priest, Zechariah, tell the priest this and tell the people of all the land and answer back these two guys and the men that came with them. Answer this question. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month were these 70 years, was it actually for me that you fasted? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. They only ask about the fifth month. They didn't ask about the seventh month. Why is God adding the seventh month? Here's the reason why. Do you know what fast that they celebrated in the seventh month? The Day of Atonement. Now, if you'll go back to Leviticus 16, to Leviticus 23, to Numbers 29, all the instruction of what's supposed to happen on the Day of Atonement is there. And not one word mentions fasting. In the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you do not see the word fasting. Not one single time. From Romans chapter 1 through the end of the New Testament, you do not see it one single time. There is not a single place in the scripture where you will find, and I will give you a year to search this out. Read the scripture and find a place where God says, I want you to fast and do it like this. You're not going to find it because it is not there. Fasting is something that all false religions do, and it's way up on the high priority list. Way up there. But not for Christianity. And it wasn't something the Jews are supposed to do either, but they brought it out of Egypt because 
whenever Jacob died, the ritual of mummifying him, which they did, included a prolonged period of fasting and mourning for the dead in Egyptian worship because he was mummified like a Pharaoh. He was worshipped like a Pharaoh to the god Ra and the god um, Ur or A, A and Ra, A-H or O-H, and the god Ra, R-A, Ramesses, King uh, Pharaoh Ramesses. He's named after the god Ra or Ah Moses. He's named after the god Ah. And there's several other those Egyptian names. They're named after, they have the word Moses after it. It means drawn from the god Ra, drawn from the god Ah. It's interesting because Moses is just Moses. He's just drawn from. But he's not drawn from any god by his name. He's just drawn from. That's what his name was. Not one time. And now they have dared to come and say, should we continue to fast on this 10th of the 5th month? And God says, you want to talk about the 10th of the 5th month? Let's talk also about the Day of Atonement. That's the one time I told you to worship. It's one thing that's so important. It's the day of at one month with God when all the sins of the people of Israel are done away with. When that high priest goes back behind the Holy of the Holies, Let's talk about that day too. Is what you parents have done that too. You know, you've done that. Your child says, "No, you know, you're talking about this." He says, "Okay, we'll talk about that." But at the same time, let's talk about this too. You know what I'm talking about? That's what God's doing here. And I'm gonna prove that to you as we go through. Look here. Okay, was it actually for me? Let's finish the rest of the line. Fifth and seventh month, these seventy years, was it actually for me that you fasted? Now. There was another day in the seventh month that they also fasted. So let's just get it on the table because some commentators believe that he's not talking about the Day of Atonement here as I do. They believe they're talking about the death of Gedaliah. Gedaliah, whenever uh, Nebuchadnezzar took out Zechariah and took him over to Babylon, he set up Gedaliah as the governor, not the king of Israel, but the governor in the fifth month. In the seventh month, three months later, Nebuchadnezzar's had it with Gedaliah. He chases him out of Jerusalem up into the hills and finally kills him and all his men. But he's just the governor. He had no right to sit on the throne. He was a person who was placed there by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I don't think the Lord, in my personal theology opinion, uh, from everything that I've studied in the Scripture, that the Lord's talking about the death of Gedaliah here because he wasn't placed on that throne like Zedekiah was by the Lord. I think he's talking about the Day of Atonement, the important day in the month, in the seventh month. He says, look here, verse 6, When you eat and drink, do you not eat for yourselves, and do you not drink for yourselves? Huh. So these 70 years, when you fasted on the fifth month and the seventh month, did you do this for yourselves or you did it for me? Uh, when you turn around and when you eat, do you eat for me or do you eat for yourselves? What do you eat for? Isn't it wonderful how God just flips everything around both sides of the story? Let's just talk about both sides of the coin at the same time here. Do you do it for me or do it for you? Well, you cannot eat for the Lord and you know what's going to happen to you? Your body is going to hurt. Because as Paul said over in 1 Corinthians, the bodies or the stomachs made for food and the food's made for the stomach. Over whenever they're on the ship that's going to be shipwrecked, and those men on the ship are fasting and worshiping their Lord, their God, not the true God. And Paul comes out and says, Look, guys, y'all have gone 14 days trying to worship your God. It's not done you any good whatsoever. You haven't eaten, you haven't got the strength. Come, I'm going to fix you some food. You're all going to eat, and we're going to make it. The body's for food, food's for the body. You need to eat. That was Paul's answer to that. I think it's a pretty good answer. Are not these the words which the, Lord, which the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous along with its cities around it and the Negev and the foothills were inhabited? He's saying to them, look, before you were taken to exile, I have already talked about this with the prophets who were telling you and you were not listening. Now, 
I added that because it's in the next, script, next scriptures where we get on down in Zechariah. But before we go to Zechariah, let's go to one of those prophets and find out. There are several that I could have gone to you. We've already talked about some of those. Since we have not studied Isaiah in this series yet, I just went to Isaiah to pick that one out. So look here. Isaiah 53, verse 3. I should have started with verse 1 because it tells you who's talking. Let me tell you who's talking. The people are crying out to Isaiah uh, to God, and they're asking a question. Here's their question. Why have we fasted and you did not see? God, why have we fasted and you did not see? Now they ask another question. Why have we humbled ourselves and you did not notice? We humbled ourselves. We bowed our heads. We got on our knees. And God, you did not notice. First of all, I want you to understand, when God doesn't answer you, it's a good thing. Now, don't be out of God's will by making a threesome question. If God doesn't answer me, I'm going to flip the coin. I want this or I want that. God, am I supposed to have this or that? Well, God's not answering. Okay, we'll flip the coin. So I'm either going to get this or that. The answer was he didn't want you to have either of them. You follow me? You're out of God's will because you flipped the coin. You did not get a true answer from God that he wanted you to have either of them. So you decided, well, if God's not going to answer, I'll just get it. <laughs> Folks, you're shaking your heads up and down. Because you've been there, hadn't you? You've been there. When God doesn't answer, your answer is don't do it. When you do not have a clear vision do, from answer from God, do not do it. Just for grins. We went through a whole thing about a year and a half ago where we were going to move and change houses. We actually have a buyer for our house. We have a standing offer for our house at a set price from the next door neighbor who wants to buy our house. And the price is set. If we ever want to sell it, ever, they will buy it at a set price and I like the price. Whether the price, that's the price today or that's the price in five years or that price in ten years, I am happy with that price. I'm not going to try to get market value, whatever, from my house because I didn't buy it for market value. I am willing to let it go to them because they live there. Their kids are living there with them. They'd like to expand it. They can have our house at a set price. So knowing that, we went looking for houses down in a place, and boy, Kay had picked out about 10 of them. <laughs> And, we, and it, there just something was wrong, and we could not get a perfect answer to these. And lo and behold, she pulled up yesterday, repo houses to start looking for houses again. And about 80% of the houses in this section down in the League City area were foreclosed on. Now, you don't want to live in an area that's foreclosed on, folks. The prices are, the prices, in fact, this is the perfect time for us to go buy. It really is, because the prices are half of what they're worth. Half. The banks are willing to get rid, take them for half. The problem is, is I'm not sure that the economy is going to turn around for the next 10 years to be able to get what, it's, what I'm paying for them out of them, but you never know. We, we might seek God on this now because we have waited, and this is the way it is in everything, folks. If those who wait upon the Lord, mm-mm and have not just wasted every penny of what they've got. Things come along, there are blessings, and that's how we got in the house we're in now. We bought it in a downtime. The house that I lived in before, and Joanne, Tony Minchu live in, we bought it in a horrible time in 87. It was good for us. We had the money. It was bad for the people who lost it to a repo. Well, I like repos. You know, I can fix anything. So I wasn't worried about that. Listen, the reason why I say that is... <clears throat> There are times when you don't get an answer from God, and when you don't get an answer, you have to say, no, no, wait. Most of y'all don't know this, but two years ago, um, there was a church over in another city that was really, really wanting me, wanting me bad to be their pastor. And I struggled. I really struggled. But I never could get an answer from God. So they've got a new pastor now. Boy, am I so glad that I did not go. I am so glad. Because I see what they're doing to him and what's going on after having a 40-year pastor at that church. And that 40-year pastor still controlling everything even though the pastor lives in another state. It wasn't right. No clear vision. Don't flip a coin. The answer is no. God, why did we humble ourselves and you did not notice you did not notice. 
No. Why? Because he's got a no answer. There's more reason than that. Behold, this is Isaiah speaking, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Remember how the Jews do it? You can't do that. You can't, you can't carry that water. That Oh, that's too much for you to carry. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't walk more than the Sabbath day's journey. What? Oh, your ox is in the ditch. You can't, I can't do anything about that. Oh, you want to do that? No, you can't do that. Nope, nope, nope. You gotta, sorry, you're going to starve today. <clears throat> you're going to starve. Can't, can't, can't do that because today's a holy day. You can't do this. You want to drink of what? You can't drink. It's a fast day. You're sick. I'm sorry. You're sick. No nourishment for you today. It's a fast day. <clears throat> you want to be with the Lord out here on this holiday, on this wedding holiday? You know, uh, and you want to, so, you, so, so why you, the rest of the whole Israel nation is fasting. Why aren't you fasting? And Jesus says, well, they've got the bridegroom here. As long as the bridegroom here, they don't need to fast, do they? You're breaking the rules. What are you doing in that house of that sinner, that tax collector, Matthew, after all? Remember that passage? That's the way they are. You drive them hard. Behold, you fast for contention and strife to strike with the wicked fist. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you have this spirit in you. I'm the inspector. <laughs> Did you see him do that? Look at it. That clothes weight, those, those clothing weighs too much. Did you see what she was wearing on her feet? Why, those heels were nine inches high. And her toes were sticking out. I don't even see how she got. <laughs> hey, I did. They were white before Easter. Can you believe they? <laughs> we don't do that much anymore, do that? But y'all remember that? <laughs> were white before Easter. Did you hear that music over that service we were having? Oh, they beat them drums so loud. And that guitar. <laughs> Can you believe? That's of the devil. I'm the fruit inspector. You know what I'm talking about. That's what it is. That's what these people had gotten down to. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked, wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. What you're doing is not to make your voice heard on high. No, you do it because you want to do it. It's a self-made human institution that you're doing. And that's what had happened on the fifth month. They had made their own self-made human institution. It wasn't of God. Folks, in Esther, when Esther says, we're going to celebrate this day of Purim, it's not the Lord instructing them to do Purim. It was Esther, and it was not from God. Just threw that in extra for you. That's it. Verse 5. <laughs> what you're doing, is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Is that what you're doing it for? That's the way other religions do it. Are you doing the same thing in the Jewish religion, here in the Jewish faith, because you think that's supposed to get an answer from me? Will you call this a fast? Will you call this an acceptable day of the Lord? What you're doing on my day of atonement, is that what, you, is that what I instructed you to do? You think that's important to me? What you're doing on this fifth, fifth day of the fifth of the month, you think that's important to me? Do you think all that's important? That's not important to me. You think that's acceptable? Let me ask you some questions on what I think is acceptable. Is this not the fast that I choose, which I choose? And he's fixing to tell us, if you want to do something that's fasting, here's how to do it. To loosen the bonds of wickedness. Get rid of wickedness. All around you. To undo the bands of the yoke. Get rid of the bondage you're putting on people. <clears throat> and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. To let those who are under bondage to everything going on. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Get rid of all that. That's acceptable. By the way, that's the same answer that the Lord gives when over in James chapter 1. Go pull the notes. If you don't have the notes, go get them off the web. Under I Connect, Jim Hastings, all the notes for everything that we've got is there. Through Everything's there. Or says, you think you've got religion and you don't bridle your tongue? Let me tell you what true religion is. True religion is taking care of the widows and taking care of the orphans and taking care of the poor. That's true religion. You want to know what true fasting is? It's taking care of the widows. It's taking care of the orphans. It's taking care of those who are poor and have no place to go. You're free. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. 